All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Olavi, and I'm super excited to talk about my mistakes. I'm going to talk about a project that I started back in 2014 and didn't know much of coding back then. Or like, at least I made a huge bunch of mistakes during this project, and I have learned also a bunch of things. So I thought it would be interesting to share um, some of the mistakes I made and some of the lessons I learned from those. And Maybe if nothing else, this will be probably a funny presentation because we will be roasting my own code soon. But let's start with a bit about the project. And it's a Selfish OS application. So let's talk a bit about what Selfish OS is. I don't know how many of you have heard about it, but it's a small mobile operating system. It's tiny compared to Android and iOS and even tiny compared to Windows Mobile, which is dead. It's a mobile operating system based on Nokia Amigo, which was shut down. So former Nokians started a new company to build their own operating system. And uh, it has a small small community. And uh, one of the biggest pain points of this platform is that it has quite small amount of apps, like native apps. There is support for running Android apps in it, but of course, you want to have native applications built with Qt to get a better performance and stuff like that. And the selection of officially supported devices is a bit lacking still. I personally have one device here in my daily use. Uh, it's a Sony Xperia X where I can uh, license the selfie shows. I, I think I paid 50 euros for the license so that I can use it on this device and install it officially. And then there's there are a lot of community builds for different devices. And here you can see, if you can see it, but I'm, I'm using my application for tracking my working hours. So let's move on. So what is Working Hours Tracker? I think the name says it all. It's a Selfish OS application that I built starting in 2014. I built it because I was working in multiple uh, like side jobs. And then I was studying, doing some open source stuff and stuff like that. So I wanted to track my work, work hours. And here are some of the screenshots from the application, uh, from different views. And here is a picture of me developing the app. So I, was, I have, a, uh, in this picture from the left, I have the Yolla tablet, and then there's Yolla C, Yolla One. And then I think this is the Sony Xperia. X in, on the right. So I'm running the application on all of those and testing different features and different views layouts on all of those. And yeah, so let's get to the fun part of this presentation. So let's roast my code. So let's look at some of the biggest mistakes I made. And then after that, I, we can talk about what I have learned about this. And would I approve my own code now if somebody would make a PR or if I would see the PR adding this kind of code, I would probably not approve it. But this is also one of my points in this presentation is that if you look at your own code, old, old code and look, look at it and it looks horrible, you're laughing at it, it probably means that you have learned a lot of stuff. So don't be ashamed of that. So this is the main view of the app. On the main view, the first page, which actually, yeah, I'm, I'm calling it first page on the, on the code level as well. So there I have uh, eight different categories. And for all of those categories, uh, we show a number which says how many hours you have worked in that category. And uh, if you think about the data model for this kind of view, and like, so try to think about how many database queries would you do in order to render this view. And remember, there's no such thing as GraphQL. What I ended up, <laughs> up doing in 2014, and this is still part of the repository, is that I would do for each of those categories, I would do one database query. So I would build an object data that would have all of those categories. And each of these would call the database, have a SQL query to the database, uh, which is like, and in addition, I'm also doing a different uh, query for the project on the top there. So it, I think nine, yeah, nine, nine database queries for rendering a simple first page view. Yeah, I guess you could do this with SQL. 
but probably I didn't know it. And the data amounts were so small that in practice it didn't matter. But of course, I would do it differently nowadays. And then here's a classic <laughs> nice example of an email validator, which basically validating email addresses with regex is quite hard. It's not an easy task to get an regex that actually validates all the possible different syntaxes of email addresses and stuff like that. But here I I think I have made it quite simple. <laughs> so in the beginning, I'm checking for an empty string and accepting that as an valid email, which <laughs> I don't know why. There's no comments even about why I did this. So yeah, when you look at this kind of code after months or years, you're like, why? Why didn't I even comment here? Like, why is an empty string a valid email address? And then uh, there's so much wrong in this. So one more thing. Okay, first of all, the comment on the top, it makes no sense. Only it brings no additional value. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see the commit message. So I, I took a screenshot from uh, VS Code. And here you can see that three years ago, I made a commit that said update copyright year. So first of all, why did that commit touch this line? It makes no sense. And second thing, why would I update the copyright year? I think I didn't understand how copyright works at that time. And then this is like one of the stupid stuff I did in this project is that I extended this string prototype uh, with a function called to HHMM, which would then format a string as you would see in the front, you saw in the first page, we would render hours and minutes. And then I built this on the bottom here, you can see this helpers.pad. So I have basically built my own left pad. So why would you need left pad if you can do this in one line of JavaScript? And then in the project, when I'm looking at it, I have been like discussing with myself with code commits. So the first comment here is from five years ago. And then I had like been thinking about why did I do it like this? And then I wrote like, please refactor this. And then three years ago, I, I have been looking at these slides and thinking like, why did I comment like that? I, I didn't write specific enough to do comment. So I didn't know what to do here because this looks like, looks like this is fine. So those were some examples from the code base. Actually, these are like examples from the code base from the master branch right now. So even after I have been doing some couple of big refactorings on the code base, still there's a lot of fun, funny mistakes there. So let's talk about the lessons learned and uh, the mistakes I made. So first mistake I made when I was like starting this project. So selfie shows is based on Qt, and in Qt you build the views with QML. And because I'm I'm a web developer, then Q QML, you can think about it like, it's almost like HTML and JavaScript. And of course, with JavaScript, you can do everything. So I ended up doing everything with JavaScript because that was what I knew about and I was able to do stuff. But probably I should have looked more into how to actually do real cute applications with uh, using the C++ side and then using signals and slots to update the view and stuff like that. And here is a, on the right, you can see an example of me allocating the code generating a email with a lot of data processing on the with JavaScript. And also uh, one of the mistakes in this project is that I built these kind of features where you can send an email report. I guess nobody ever used this feature. So this project, I launched it quite early. After like starting it, I launched it in the actual official Yolla store. Um, so in the beginning, it was a crappy code base. The database was horrible, and I had to do a lot of fixes and releases. And as my co goal during this project, I have had that I want to try to not break the application for anyone who has installed it. So I always wanted to make sure that up when upgrading the application, I would fix the stuff, then like uh, keep the application backwards compatible. I think this was one of the mistakes um, I should have because this was a small, after all, quite small project. And those most active users could have upgraded or installed another version. If I would have started 
basically from scratch or like rethinking the database, rethinking everything, the logic and rewritten everything from, and then released a version two of the application, but I never did this. So that's why I have a lot of code, like you can see on the right side. This is uh, some code that we need to run every time somebody opens the application. So we're we're going to check if the database version matches. And if it doesn't, well, then we need to do some modify the table and check, change some and fix some mistakes in the database because I released some faulty versions that it would alter some lines in the database and make, make some crappy data in the there. So that's my like one of my lessons in this project is that I could have a bit more easily built a version two out of this. And the overall quality would have been a lot better. So basically probably more happy users and stuff like that. Yeah. So then about the database design, I already mentioned something, but I made so many mistakes in the database design. First of all, I didn't use any foreign keys in the database. So I would have tables for hours, then projects and and tasks. And then when you save an, save an hour row, then we would save a project ID as string into that line. And then when fetching the data for the views, we would then in JavaScript search in the project list for that ID. And yeah, that makes no sense. Should have used, used database for that. And uh, the biggest of all mistakes in this project was that, because this was a working hours tracker, and for some reason in the beginning, I thought in 2014, I thought that it would be a good idea to save the start time as a string with hours and minutes. And this is the stupidest mistake ever. You should never save any timestamps as a string with hours and minutes. It makes no sense. So don't be like me. Then one of the things that kind of surprised me over the years has been that it takes surprisingly long, long time amount of time to handle all the releases and uh, write the release notes and deploy different versions to different environments and then making sure everything is up to date. And so this is one of the things that I would probably in a future project, I would automate as much as possible and write the re release notes and stuff like that only once if possible. Now at the moment, I think I need to write the release notes into five different places, which makes no sense. And documentation, it is super important also in a solo project. So this, there has been some contri contributors to this project and it's open source. So maybe like eight people in total have been contributing to this per project, but mostly it has been me doing a solo, solo project. And then if you have breaks between maintaining the project like a couple months or sometimes even a year, and then you go back into the project and then you realize you don't know how to even start it and you don't know how to deploy or like release a new version. So that's why documentation is the key, even in a small solo project. And there are a lot of sides to documentation. It's not only about readmes and stuff like that. It's also about the code comments and commit messages, pull request uh, descriptions, um, basically everything. Then one thing that I have learned during this project is the comparison between app development and web development. So in a way, web development is quite easy. You're building a website that is hosted on a server. Your users come to the web, fetch the page from the server, and they get always the up-to-date version of the web page. Uh, but in app development, you have to build a new version of the app, uh, send it for review, and then after it is, has been approved, then your users can choose to upgrade if they want to. And in Selfish OS, there is no way to force anyone to upgrade. There's only manual updates at the moment. And But in both cases, local data can cause issues. So in web development, you can think about like local storage. If you store something on the local storage or any other local storage 
wait, that makes no sense. So local database on the cookies or local storage on the client's device, then you have to think about versioning. If you change the data model, you have to be able to migrate the existing data or delete it or something like that. And this application that I built was completely offline. The database was on the or is on the mobile device and there's no no server whatsoever. So every time I change the database model, I needed to make sure it gets migrated also on the everyone's devices when they upgrade. And then if I made a mistake, I would have to publish a new version and hope that users would upgrade. And then you could have some crap in the database due to some bugs. And then sometimes I had to deploy a version that would run some scripts to delete some broken lines or stuff like that, fix some invalid data in the database. And then I have basically no control over it. I just hope that it works. I, I didn't collect any analytics or anything if it breaks. The only thing I knew was the feedback that I got from the most active users, not like everyone. And then a couple of additional lessons I have learned is that you shouldn't start with the advanced features too early in almost any project. So focus on the core features. Um, as an example, I mentioned the email reports in the in the app, and then I built also this quite complex uh, like exporting and importing logic, which probably hasn't been used by almost anybody. So focus on the core features that your users actually need and leave the nice to have features for later. And refactorings in these kind of projects where you know you have made a lot of crappy code in the past, it would be, you would easily want to refactor everything at once, but please don't do it. I started a couple of two large refactorings and ended up almost giving up. And then the end result was not that. Like it, it was from the user's point of view, they get got, got no benefit. They actually got some new bugs. And so it would have been a lot, of, lot better to start with making the code base better in small chunks and then deploy small changes. And then over time or over months or over years, it would get into a better shape. And then this application is actually translated to, I can't remember how many exactly, but about at least 10 different languages. And there has been more than 20 people helping with the translations uh, in Transifex. So Transifex is a pretty nice platform for crowdsourcing translations. You can publish a project there announce it somewhere else, maybe in Twitter or somewhere, and then people will join the project and help you translate it if you need to. I think it works at least for small open source projects. Of course, not for real business cases. Coming to the end of this presentation, I wanna share the like the biggest lesson I've learned during this project. And now looking back at this project, it is that you shouldn't be ashamed of your past code. It's actually, nice if you can look at your old code and laugh at it and admit that you have made mistakes in your past but it's just good because it means you have learned new stuff and then you can if if need be you can actually fix those mistakes but it doesn't even matter the best thing is that when you're working on your next project you won't make the same stupid mistakes again you will of course always make mistakes but not the same mistakes at least not many times again so don't be afraid of making mistakes. And also don't be afraid of sharing your mistakes. Might help other people learn as well. And this presentation is actually based on a blog post that I published this week. So you can go and go ahead and read the blog post. There's a bit more details that I didn't fit into this presentation. And also there's a couple of fun facts that I didn't share here. And the, the project has been sponsored by Spice Program. So thank you for the Spice Program. It's been helpful in this project as well. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Awesome.